I have the locked book. The, one that, the only book we have that comes anywhere near the description of the book that could, will kill you if you open it. But it's a Catholic missile. Well, it looks kind of ominous. No, actually, it's just, just a hymnal. Look at that one. You want me to close this up? Let's move this down. As you can see, it has latches, which is the only thing. So you promise if I open this book, or you open this book, we're not going to commit suicide? Not as far as I know. Uh, it's a good example of the book art, but it's not even a particularly old book. It's from the 1890s. It was in a, as I understand it, in a monastery in Iowa. The monastery closed, and alumni of Whitewater saw and thought the college might like it, bought it, and gave it to us. Just for the record, I'm keeping my eyes closed when you open it. <laughs> Wow. Uh, the infamous lock book, they never give us a title, an author, a publisher, a date, anything that would identify a book. So, you know, Are you talking about this particular book? Any, you know, the, the, the supposed lock book that will kill you if you open well, it. They have never given us any kind of identifying information. Tell enough. us what happens when people come in looking for it. What's the typical, or is there a typical? I imagine you get... I pull it out, they sort of look at it and say, oh. Do they come in and just say, I want to see the book? Yes, I have had that happen. And, and who is it? Who, who Generally you? just students. students. A lot of times the RP, what, the RP tends to sign an article about it every year, so we almost always get somebody from the RP in to see it every year. I tend to show it to the archives classes when they're in here for tours. Uh, I do four to, three to five archives-related instructional sessions, and we often pull it out for them. Because it's? Because it's, it's a campus myth. And so it has its own history in addition to the history yeah. that it brought to campus we, with it. We think that part of the reason for the campus legends, and that's one of the things you're here to talk to me about, is that back before the uh, renovation in 1989, this whole area out here where there are now periodicals was a storage area, for the, a locked storage area for the library. Within that locked room, which had government documents and university archive materials, a lot of it was in a small caged area which was where we kept the university special collections. And so it was locked in a cage. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where part of the part that of these stories sense. came. Because you had, if you wanted something out of special collections, you went to the circulation desk for the government documents librarian, had somebody had to get keys out, they had to cross a hall, go over, open one door to get into the storage area, and open a third door to get into this locked area. And then, of course, the students couldn't come and look at it. We went in, pulled something out, relocked all the doors, and brought it over. And they used it in the reading room for government documents. Imagination. I think that's where a lot of it came from. And of course, there was the time they did find a casket on the on the on the University Mall. I wasn't here then. Uh, that had been dug up, mm -hmm. I think, from Calvary Cemetery. I believe I was told. And yes, the three cemeteries do make an isosceles triangle. But I don't think the Catholics were talking to to the Congregationalists when they built their cemetery. And Oak Grove is older than the other two to begin with. The original cemetery in Whitewater is actually underneath where the Congregational Church now is. When the Congregationalists decided to build that church, they moved the graves there over to what is now Oak Grove. Um, Oak Grove was used for burials for a long time. Uh, it isn't really anymore. Our um, Revolutionary War veterans are there. Mm -hmm. I think both of our uh, War of 1812 veterans may also be there. I'd have to check on that. What about, um, it's supposed to be witches buried there? Rumors? Is there any... The, that's a rumor. Uh, supposedly the witches were up around the uh, stair and water tower is where they usually met. My guess is they were probably KKK members. In the dark, the cloaks mm -hmm. would look similar. We know Whitewater had a strong KKK chapter back in the 1920s. The uh, county president of the KKK was found dead on the uh, lawn of the Methodist Church back sometime in the 20s. I could look it up for you, but I don't know the date off the top of my head. So I personally think that's where some of the witch things came from, was members, you know, people running around in their cloaks from that. Uh, there may have been other, you know, social groups that wore robes for their meetings. I've been here almost 30 years. I've never met anybody who was you know, other than the campus, the community itself, well, they're now starting to use it as a publicity thing. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, if you talk to the Chamber of Commerce, they had a big spirit tour last week. We were there. Oh, you were? Okay. Um, and, of course, the spiritual school was here. Spiritualism was a religious movement in the 19th century. It had nothing to do with witches. It did have something to do with ghosts, apparently, you know, medium spirit talking. 
<coughs> but the people who settled this part of, of Wisconsin were from the area in upstate New York where a lot of religious fervor was going on. Mm -hmm. The spiritualists were a very powerful group at the same time the Mormons were starting. The Millenarians, a number of other groups you never hear about now. The Shakers come out of that same general yep. area. Um, the Temperance Movement comes out of that area. Women's Rights comes out of that area. Uh, Anti-slavery was very strong there. And all of those people came here to Wisconsin, so it's not surprising they brought the spiritualism with them. Morris Pratt was a spiritualist. He was also a cousin of one of the founders of Whitewater. He himself was more in, over toward Milton, but, you know, he was a committed spiritualist. He, he, he said that, you know, if the spirits helped him make this major business investment up in, up, up, up in the UP, he would build a school for spiritualism, which apparently also was his home. So, you know, he hit it big up on the UP. Mm -hmm. I don't remember whether it was copper or iron, but, you know, a major mineral investment up there. Uh, came back here and built his school. And when he died, it went to the, the spiritual, spiritual Society. It was here until the 30s, when they sort of ran out of money, well, with a lot of other groups in their depression. There still is a Morris Pratt Institute in Milwaukee, which feels that it is directly connected to the school here. The school here was, taken, <coughs> was used as a college dorm in the 40s, before we had any on campus, mm -hmm. and um, was torn down sometime in the 60s to make way for a telephone building. Um, there's a picture of it out in the main room. Yeah, I saw that coming in. Uh, uh, back to the witch's book. Uh, where do you think the, the legend of anybody that read it would commit suicide or had committed suicide? I don't know. That was in that was in force before I ever became archivist, so I don't know where that part of it's coming from. Any thoughts on that? I just think it's silly. I mean, uh, this, this is an old New England town in many ways. This is not the kind of thing your average New England stern Congregationalist or Presbyterian was going to give any credence to whatsoever. Uh, you know, this was an anti-slavery town, this was a temperance town, um, it was a suffrage area. Uh, we have some ev evidence in th that, you know, the suffrage movement was very well supported in Whitewater quite early. Um, we may have been a stop on the Underground Railroad, we have no evidence, but certainly Milton was. Mm -hmm. The people who settled here would, have, would not have tolerated, you know, Witchcraft. I just it would not have settled. Here. They had a hard time with the, just the spiritualist school, didn't a they? Lot they were, of them there did, was a yes. lot of upheaval in town. I know when he chose this yes. as the as the cornerstone for it. You mm -hmm. don't collect history, but mm -hmm. you're the caretaker for it. I here. collect it too. You I do collect local history. Yes. Well, you, you sound like you have a passion from, for it. Definitely. Uh, I have two degrees in history. I have an undergraduate degree in um, basically we call it an Atlantic major, but, but primarily American history. And I have, that was from Mount Holyoke College where I did my undergraduate work. And then I have a master's degree in history from Mad American history from Madison. So when you are locking up at night or when you're looking through the, the, mm -hmm. the shelves, what's going through your mind is history. What's going through your mind is legacy. What's going through your mind is not legends and lore and superstition and student. Do you understand though how this I is so appealing to kids? And how, how do you feel about I, that I'm more of a genealogy. My personal area in, in, when I'm looking at the stacks is genealogy. Mm -hmm. I've been doing family mm -hmm. history for, 40, mm -hmm. for, for more than 40 years. A lot of the patrons I help are genealogists. We're looking for their families. So I know a lot about the families in the Whitewater area because I've been helping those people since I've been archivist, which is almost, which is 20 years. 20 years. Can you tell me, in terms of those 20 years, have the kids who have come in, or the, the general public who's come in, looking for information on Morris Pratt mm -hmm. or on the superstitions and legends, have you seen the legends build and add a little bit? A little bit. A like, little have bit. they changed over the years at all? No, it's pretty much the same superstitions we had. Okay. Uh, the university, my predecessor, or not my, my predecessor directly, but the head of reference when I came, had started a file of articles and things that were talking about the spiritualists. The spiritualists, so spiritualists okay. uh, haunted white water. This, this has been a question that's been coming to the reference desk. I think you know at least back into the fifties. Okay. So the reference department knows it's coming every year. If we see something, we clip it. If we see something on the web, we've marked that. You know, made a note of that. I think there's been more recently because of that haunted Whitewater movie they were going to make a couple of years, well, which is a Whitewater. What happened to that? Do you know why no, that by uh, production? And I couldn't find out what happened. I mean, it looks like they did a lot of filming, but anyway. Yeah, and, they, and in a place that doesn't look anything at all like Whitewater, so there's <laughs> mountains in the picture. So, so what? Uh, do you believe any of this? Do you believe in the no. witch's book or the witch? I mean, do you think it's all? I, 
don't, I don't, uh, let's put it this way. I am not close to the idea of there being, being ghosts in particular. Um, the spirituals certainly believed in them. You know, I've, I live in a house that's 150 years old. There are no, no, noises in the night that I don't know what's causing mm -hmm. them. Uh, I'm not going to go investigate them. Put it this way, I have never spoken to somebody who has been a resident of Whitewater for more than 10 years who even gives any of this any credence at all. Um, I'm good friends with Carol Cartwright, who runs, who's the uh, museum curator at the local museum, who did this, uh, talked about Morris Pratt and things at the spiritual tour. Carol's never really heard anything. We think it's a lot of stuff that just goes back to the spiritual schools, the Underground Railroad, and the Ku Klux Klan. Kind of the perfect storm. Yeah. And also people dip in and... People dip in and pull things yeah. out. It's yeah. like, I guess they did something with Mary Worth at this tour. I have been through every, every census record for Whitewater for the appropriate period. There is no Mary Worth in any census record. We don't know where this but is coming from. there's a legend about Mary yes. Worth. And can you tell us a little bit about that? I really don't know much about okay. it. All. Fact, I guess she was supposed to be a murderer. Oh. Okay. And there's supposedly there's a gravestone up in up in Calvary Cemetery, which, you know, if she is, she was not in the census. She was brought from somewhere else and buried there. If there's a Mary Worth in that cemetery, and I think I can show you the cemetery list. I don't think there is one even in the cemetery list. So well, you would know. <laughs> got it out of the desk. You want to look at it? You said there's a file that you keep. Um, it's mainly on the Pratt Institute, but you also have, you kind of just use it as a catch-all. Yeah, we use it for all the haunted Whitewater stuff. Last year, or actually three years ago now, we did a haunted book panel. We had Linda Godfrey oh. come, who's written a number of things on haunted Wisconsin. And there are plenty of people who write about haunted Wisconsin. We must have five or six books in the special collections on that topic. And they're down here because they get stolen if they were upstairs. Really? Makes sense. We had Linda here last week shooting. Okay. Because she went to school here, yeah, she's, she's got a, a history. Of, she did a lot of her research here. Yes. She uh, told us a story about being in Wells. Okay. Um, she's, she, she lived in Wells, and my daughter goes here now, and she said that, you know, that the kids talk about Wells being haunted. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I think every as university as, as, as an archivist, as a faculty member, I'm not in the dorms. I don't know what, sure. what's going on in the dorms. Right, right. I only hear the students, the students come in and bring me. And we had a student do a video a couple of years ago about haunting in Whitewater, which was quite well done. I don't know if it, I think it's on YouTube somewhere. Oh, we'll have to, we'll have to take it. Yeah, back. right. We'll so see. The, did the kids come in and say? Underground railroad, or the underground tunnels that are in Whitewater? Or there are, in some of the older homes, particularly some of the old Cream City brick homes, like the Hamilton House and the house, the, I think it's the Dora Andrew Bricks, and some of the older homes in Whitewater have bricked in cellars. And it's possible that they were used. They're old. Some of them are old enough to have been used by the Underground Railroad. We have no evidence in Whitewater. You know, I'd have a lot more belief in this haunted book, which of course they they they, they say we aren't giving them the right book anyway. If they had an author or a title or, or a publisher or something, a date. So if they came in with more specific information, we'd certainly look and see if we ever had a book by that information. Um, but with what we're given, most of the librarians say, oh, it's just, they're just being weird again. <laughs>